when we are talking about the prophetic science of the Book of Mormon or the prophetic path of the Book of Mormon, we really need to define from a Hebraic or Israelite sense what that means. And there's a little backdrop to some of this, uh, to this understanding or to this science. It actually didn't originate with the house of Israel. It actually originated with Adam and Eve after they were cast out of the garden. In, uh, in Jewish lore, uh, when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, the angel Razael came to them and gave them a book. And in that book, it contained all the secrets that would help Adam and his descendants return back into the presence of God. And in that book, uh, he recorded not only his teachings, but his genealogies, his language, everything. So wherever that actual book is now, we don't know. But we do know that God has, that has preserved many elements of this prophetic science in various uh, records of scripture, of which the Book of Mormon is one. Now, there are a lot of people these days that, uh, you know, we're seeing in our society where they, they want to throw out the Book of Mormon. And I will guarantee you the reason that many of the anti-Mormons are having such a heyday is because they are approaching the Book of Mormon from a traditional uh, Protestant Christian point of view. Yet very few actually will, will approach the, the record from an Israelite point of view. So I'd like to take some time this evening and give you a survey of some of that science. And it's not, and, and again, this, this particular presentation is, is not in the least complete because we would not, we would be here for days talking about the prophetic uh, encodings and teachings that are placed in the Book of Mormon for us to discover. But what I thought we would do tonight is begin by showing some of these things throughout the text and kind of give you a path so that you can begin to explore on your own. So again, the purpose of the, the teachings that God gave to the angel was the ability to connect heaven and earth. Well, uh, let's see. It is not letting me go to the next screen. Click on the slide itself on the left side. There we go. Okay. So first off, we need to understand that the, you know, the sacred knowledge of the science of the fathers, meaning Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Melchizedek, Enoch, all, you know, all of these good gentlemen, we, we actually considered the ancient patriarchs. The science that came down was like an umbilical cord from heaven to earth. The purpose is to connect heaven and earth. So let's take a look first off at the very, you know, one of the most important teachings in the Book of Mormon is that it, it's time frame. So if we look for a second, just at the very beginning, when it talks about, you know, that we know that uh, Lehi left Jerusalem 600 years before Christ. And we know, according to Moroni 10, that uh, it had the last date mentioned in the Book of Mormon was 420 years. Part of the science of the fathers deals with the science of numbers. Numbers mean things. They're very symbolic. And so when you look at numbers in the Book of Mormon, they have many times hidden meanings. They're meant to be looked at using various rules from ancient Israel. In this case, if we look, take the number 600, it reduces down to the number six. If we take 420 at the end of the book, it reduces down to the number six. And why is that important? Well, it gives you the idea of the letter Vav, that's the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So the, the sequence or cycle of the Book of Mormon commences on the letter Vav and it ends on the letter Vav. And the letter Vav is a symbol in one way. One of its meanings is that it is an umbilical cord for the teachings and revelations of heaven and earth. So when you see the Book of Mormon and its time frame from beginning to end, the idea is that it is a celestial uh, umbilical cord that is meant to join heaven and earth. And so one of the things I'm going to jump in here, Rob, one of the things I understood about the letter Vav is it's kind of like a stake, right? The symbol, be, yeah. the symbol is like a stake affixing one thing to another. Yes, yeah. that is one of its symbols. Uh, umbilical cord is another. And there are other, other symbolic meanings to the letter Vav, um, but it's the idea that it's a connecting point. You know, a nail, if you were, a fixed nail, like a nail in a sure place, um, those type of things. Um, when we look at the Book of Mormon, 
it, it will give us this type of overarching uh, pattern so that you're seeing one complete cycle from Vav to Vav. Um, and again, it gives you the idea of, okay, this is my umbilical cord to heaven. So what are some of the most important symbols as we, you know, receive nourishment from this umbilical cord of heaven? What are some of those symbols that we should be looking at? Well, let's see if I can get there again. Some of these symbols, the very first one we should realize is that everything in the Torah, in the prophets, even in the New Testament, and especially in the Book of Mormon, is heavily dependent upon a centralized symbol, the tree of life, the very tree of life that exists in the Garden of Eden. Now, there are various representations of the tree of life, but what you're seeing here are some of the most common. The idea of a tree, now, it, it looks strange to us because is it really a tree? Well, to the left there, you'll see the twin pillars of the temple, Yaqin and Boaz, okay? And in the center, you see the center pillar. And wherever you see those spheres, we call them sephirot, okay? And those particular spheres are emanations or the characteristics and attributes of God, okay? We, as a human being, are a tree. People and trees in Hebrew are synonymous as symbolically. And so, in a sense, we are a tree. Christ is a tree. So when we see this symbol, especially like of Lehi, uh, going to the tree of life, this is a, a centralized symbol that you want to explore because it gives you a pattern, not only for your, in a sense, your physical body, but also your spiritual body and our connection and relationship with heaven. So in each of these things, for example, you'll see in the center there, the Vitruvian man actually laid out according to the same pattern. Um, this is why when Lehi's dream, if you look at the descriptions that he gives, and we can't go them to them all here, but if you look at the, at the, the description he gives of the tree, um, and the, even Nephi later when he talks about an, an iron rod, which really are an iron branch or vine of the tree, uh, and there is an actual iron branch and symbolically on the tree in ancient Israel. Um, but the idea is that it is a centralized symbol. And you will see this symbol being drawn upon as, as God talks about wisdom and understanding, mercy and justice, uh, beauty, long-suffering, glory, and of course, we call it Yesod, the foundation. And of course, we are at the very, in, symbolically in a sense, in a world-like sense, we are at the very bottom of God's kingdom in number 10 there, at the very base in a place we call it Malkut. But it's a symbol. It is a symbol meant to help us uh, to get a visual of attributes and a pattern that God is trying to get us to understand. So this is why you see in the Book of Mormon this centralized uh, element, the tree of life. Now, not only is that element to be understood in a, in a microscopic form in a sense of us as people, it's also macroscopic or, uh, or even macrocosmic, if you will in that everything follows a basic pattern. And in that pattern, if you expand it out geometrically, it forms the flower of life as well as the, the, the seed of life. It will follow the, the platonic solids. Much There's much knowledge of astronomy, uh, mathematics, spirituality, all built into this. And your approach to the record will give you or yield those that information that you are seeking depending on your approach. So in other words, when we approach the Book of Mormon, because it is a multidimensional text or an encrypted or sealed text, how we approach it is just as important as what, what we are looking at. We need to understand what is our intent. So if I were to look for the science of the fathers, the first thing I would be looking at is the tree of life as a symbol. The next thing we'd want to look at is the idea of the knowledge of the heavens. The Book of Mormon actually is, an, is a, a very astronomical book it's a, a, it contains a, a cosmology, if you will, and it's very much embedded into the text. When we, we read right over it from our American point of view, but from a Hebrew concept, many of these symbols are right in front of our eyes, and yet we read right over them. And the very first time we come across this is actually in 1 Nephi. 
here, after, after Lehi had uh, seen the pillar of fire upon the rock, he went home, cast himself down, and says this, and it came to pass that he returned to his own house at Jerusalem, and he cast himself upon his bed, being overcome with the Spirit and the things which he had seen. And being overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he saw the heavens open. And he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded by numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Now, in our oftentimes in our American mind, we think of an idea of a throne with God literally sitting on it and angels, concourse of angels literally around him. In addition to that image, anciently, you were meant to look at the constellations of the zodiac as being, you know, those concourses of angels. There's a very interesting connection anciently between stars and angels. And something won't go into here to great depth, but basically when you see the ideas of stars and angels, they are a connected, uh, they're a connected symbol. And so in this case, he goes on in his account and notice what he says. And it came to pass that he saw one descending out of the midst of heaven and he beheld that his luster or in Hebrew, his zohar, his radiance, his radiance, his brilliance, was above that of the new sun at noonday. And he also saw 12 others, there are 12 signs in our zodiac as well, following him, and their brightness did, did exceed that of the stars in the firmament. Notice the parallelism of the 12 with the stars in the firmament. And they came down and went forth upon the face of the earth. And the first came and stood before my father, and him and gave unto him a book and bade him that he should read. Now we're being drawn a picture, and we think of it in very in our in our Greek mindset in very ultra literal terms. And I do believe that he had a vision of that and was given an interpretation of that. But at its foundation, he's beholding the heavens, and he's seeing that there is this celestial body, and there are tw that that the twelve others, the zodiac, surrounds. And it talks about their brightness, or the brightness of those 12 in our zodiac, we call it in the Hebrew, the Maserot, uh, exceeds that of the other stars in the firmament. And they came down and went forth upon the face of the earth. In other words, the, 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 the sun through ecliptic, or the signs of the zodiac, begin to fall be below the horizon. And they gave him a book. So there was something about this particular celestial um, vision of the stars and its interpretation that was then given to him as a message or a book or a scroll. And that is where we get the interpretation. Of the, we, we, we correlate that with the idea of the Son of God and the 12 apostles, kind of the idea of that. But the idea underlying it is that we should be able to see that there is extensive astronomical knowledge in the Book of Morning, Mormon, waiting to be tapped. And why? Well, in, in ancient Israel and in most of the ancient cultures, we need to understand that there's a, an eternal principle that comes from, we often call it, uh, sometimes called the first law of Enoch, but you may have heard it before, as above, so below, as within, so without. This is why you see so many megalithic structures around the world, like the Great Pyramids and others, that correspond or parallel or patterned after the, the particular stars. So like, for example, the Great Pyramids follow the uh, Orion's belt. And you will see, especially in the Book of Mormon, a, a strong uh, symbolism uh, using astronomical figures. So they're often personified, but the underlying idea is where it's meant to communicate ideas and understanding of the heavens, astronomy, there, there's times and seasons, the appointed times, but it's also meant to give us a prophetic sense because prophecy and the stars and the rotation of the heavens were connected in the ancient mind. So for example, let's take a look at some of these, some of these symbolic things that we often miss. So first off is actually the person Lehi, and he actually has a, a, a connection to the constellation Taurus. Now, why? Well, if you'll notice on the right, the, the story of Samson fighting with, uh, you know, he, he basically slays the Philistines with a with the jawbone of a, of a donkey or an ass, okay? 
Well, the name for the jawbone of a donkey or ass is lehi, lehi. Now, why would the two be called that? Well, when you see names in the Book of Mormon and you see similar Hebrew words, there is actually a relationship. And in this case, the um, you will see a teaching regarding the uh, uh, the constellation Taurus, which is actually the constellation Taurus is the is the constellation anciently, which was called the mountain of the Lord's house, the constellation Taurus. Um, the bull representing the god El, uh, Elohim, uh, and that was considered the mountain of the Lord's house in a particular era. And so the actual jawbone is the is the stars in the uh, constellation Taurus called the Hyades. And there's an interesting correlation there between the stars, the story of Samson, his actual story is a pattern of a celestial event. D not only does it describe uh, an actual, you know, hist potential historical event, but the, it is written in such a way so that we can uh, embrace other teachings. And a, a primary teaching that we're also meant to understand, the knowledge of the ancients is the knowledge of the stars, the times, the seasons the constellations and their rotation. And if you have a chance, go take a look at 88 and the DNC 88 with that concept in mind. This is why all the light and all the stars, their things are given in their times and seasons. But another thing, which I think is even more important than that, is Nephi and the Orion mystery. The name ne Nephi or Nephi uh, actually shares with it its in its parent root, the same word for Nephil, giant. And originally, the giant was actually uh, referred to as uh, the constellation Orion. In fact, every time you see something, for example, like, say, Nephi cutting off the head of Laban or Lavan, while we're getting a literal story, he's also couched an astronomical story in it or astronomical symbol. When the sword of Orion comes into a mighty one, comes into conjunction with the with the light of the moon lavan the, the light of the moon is lavan it's teaching us something there when we see nephi breaking his bow this is also an astronomical picture of orion and his bow falling below the horizon the ship a celestial ship when he builds his vessel to sail to the land of promise it is also an astronomical symbol and these type of things fill the Book of Mormon. And if you think that's all, take a look at the seven churches in the land of Zarahemla. Okay, or Zarahamila, <laughs> children of the covenant. There were seven churches. Now, there were seven churches in the land of Zarahemla, and it came to pass that whoever was desirous to take upon them the name of Christ or of God, they did join the churches of God, and they were called the people of God, and did pour out his spirit upon them, and they were blessed and prospered in the land. The idea of the seven churches is connected with the Pleiades in the constellation Taurus. It is the same concept that you will see, I believe it's Isaiah 4, where it says, in that day, seven women will take hold of one man. The actual astronomical picture it's painting is that the seven women, the Pleiades, and the things that they symbolize will join themselves to the one man. And who is the one man? yod heh vav -He, Yehovah, God. And when those stars and what they symbolize join, okay, or connect themselves into Yehovah, then they will become a beautiful branch. So there's a very interesting teaching along those seven churches because they're connected with the idea of the seven rungs of Jacob's ladder of the seven double letters in Hebrew and the blessings and cursings that come as we choose to ascend or descend. If we ascend, we receive blessings. If we descend, you know, then we receive the cursings. So there's very intricate teachings that are, that are literally woven into the text. And so in this case, if you notice on the right there, if you can see it, um, there's an arrow that points to the Pleiades in the constellation Taurus or close to Taurus, and those are the seven churches. There are many other symbols, and we won't go into all of them, but because I want these to get into something more, but I wanted to show that astronomical knowledge is actually filled throughout the text. 
we could go on all night showing all the different astrotheological symbols of the Book of Mormon, and yet we wouldn't even begin to touch upon them. So in the book, we're going to skip for a second. Now we're going to talk from about astronomy to the science of numbers. There's an actual science of numbers that came down. And I'm going to use a thing from here from the, from the book of Helaman. You know, in my opinion, the book of Helaman is probably one of the most neglected books in the Book of Mormon. While on the Peshat, or literal level, we are given a story that appears to be an account of the social and political struggles between the Nephites and the Gadianton robbers, the book is actually encoded with, ancient, with the ancient prophetic teachings of Israel that we as individuals are meant to learn. It is these teachings which hold the keys to entering in by the gate, becoming sanctified, understanding the tongue of angels, and what is called the secret of the Messiah in Hebrew, what we would probably refer to as the second comforter. So let's take a look. To understand this mystery, we have to actually go to the end of the book of Alma by a man by the name of Hagoth. Okay, now I know in Mormonism we call him Hagoth, and we think we, we have the story that he's the father, father of the Polynesians, and that could be in a literal sense for all I know. But on a symbolic sense, there's something, there's a greater teaching here that is meant to serve as a prophetic marker. So first, Hagoth is a curious man. When you see that phraseology, curious, curious workmanship, you know you're in a temple text. You know you're in a sacred teaching, something that has to do with the prophetic. So let's take a look here. It actually commences, the part I want us to look at is Alma 63.4. Now notice this. These numbers and the words that they use are very significant. And it came to pass that in the 30th and 7th year of the reign of the judges, there was a large company of men, even to the amount of 5,000 and 400 men with their wives and their children, and they departed out of the land of Zarahemla into the land which was northward. Now, whatever model that you, you know, adhere to, uh, whether it be a Mesoamerican or a heartland model, and, I, you know, I personally like the heartland a little more, but I'll leave that up to anybody's choice. My model, which is not my model at all, goes back a little bit more anciently of what the, the pattern that this story is meant to give us. And it's a very intricate teaching and how they wove it into the text. So let's take a look for a second at what we're talking about here. So first off, to understand the mystery of Hagoth, we need to understand what was called the Hebrew archetype or Israelite archetypal universe. In other words, there's a pattern. We often call it the cosmic cube. You may know it as something called the New Jerusalem, as a cube very similar to what uh, Ezekiel talks about in its dimensions of the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. This cosmic cube is a pattern for many things that you see, not only in the Torah and the New Testament and the Book of Revelation, but up specifically in the Book of Mormon. And if you'll notice what he says here, it says it in verse 5, and it came to pass that Hagoth, he being an exceedingly curious man, therefore he went forth and built an exceedingly large ship by the borders of the land bountiful, by the land desolation, and launched it forth into the West Sea by the narrow neck of land, or the narrow neck, which land to the, led to the land northward. Now, in ancient Israel, the idea of the cube and the spaces between the cube and its surfaces correspond to the waters that of in Genesis above and below. In other words, they are seas. So when you see this description of the land bountiful with the sea east, the sea west, the sea north, and the sea south, not only is it giving you a description of the literal land, it's also giving you, pointing you to this archetypal cube or universe. And if you'll notice to the, at the, uh, uh, the diagram to the right and the top there, uh, you will see bountiful in the center with the sea west, and the sea west is where all, all people who seek God, who seek further light and knowledge, travel from the west to the east, and then they go north for a reason. But the idea here is you will see the sea east, the sea west, the sea north, and the sea south. It's just stated a little differently. It, they're using geographical terms to communicate this same concept. 
But you'll notice in the bottom one, I put the Hebrew letters in there. In this letter, in this is the Hebrew alphabet. We have three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 elemental letters. And they actually are symbolic, not only of uh, certain celestial bodies, but also um, they're a roadmap in a sense that would guide a person here on earth, as well as potentially even a person in the stars, depending on your, your point of reference. Now, if we look up a little closer, I want to give you a closer view. But again, this is why this symbol of the cube, the cosmic cube, is so important. Because the, uh, the, numero the numbers in Hebrew of a perfect cube are the numbers, is the number 24. And that 24 is very important because what, how many plates were there of the gold plates of, you know, of the Jaredites? There were 24. That, and they were gold. So the number 24 actually says that, that those particular plates contained this ancient knowledge of the fathers, the knowledge of the celestial realm, and this cube structure, and the idea of the teachings behind it. Gold, the, the metal, representing things of the upper world, of the highest upper world, uh, what we would consider celestial or atzalut in, uh, uh, in Hebrew. Now, let's take a look at why this mystery is so important. One of the, there's a science of numbers in Hebrew, and we're going to, I'm just going to show this to you because I know it can get a little intricate, but the first thing you want to do when you look at the number 5400 is you want to distill it to its lowest common denominator. 5400 distills to nine. Five plus four is nine. The two zeros drop off. Nine is the letter Tet in Hebrew. Tet is the ninth letter. It's associated with the constellation Leo, with the knowledge of secret and the secret of all spiritual activities, and the direction north above on the cube of space, the Hebrew architect of the universe. If you'll notice there to the right, there's Tet. It's in the land northward. And where did those 5,400 people go? To the land northward. Now, notice that it also said in there, they went there with their wives and children. From, from a numbers aspect, the different breaking down of the numbers into various composite or various components yields different symbols, all of which are to help paint a picture of what he's talking about. And this type of new, this type of numeric picture painting is found in many of the numbers in the Book of Mormon. And I guess if you're limited on space on plates and you want to communicate something, use numbers. In fact, I've gone through every single number in the Book of Mormon. It has an interesting equidistant lettering and numbering sequence that there is no way Joseph Smith could have ever put it, created this. Not only does it tell me that it's a prophetic record Hebraically by its sequence, but also the numbers that it, that it does not disclose. And it always does it in a pattern. So if we look carefully at this, we see, of course, nine, the letter Tet, represents the land northward. And of course, 5,000 distills to 500, distills to 50, and distills to five. These are your mothers and is your wives and children. And the idea of the numbers as you break them down, the smaller they get, wives the larger, children are the, as they break down in their component parts. And these are the symbols. So the letter five is the letter hey. It's connected with the idea of revelation, meditation, and visions. The, uh, the number 400, tav, a mark. The letter Tav is the special sign of the Lord in his holy temple, and it represents the point of control at the center of the heart. It's also the numeric equivalent of the word Nashim, which is wives, which connects the king, Messiah, or to Tiferet, beauty, to his bride down here in Malput, and it's also equal to those things of the heavens, the Shemaim. So each of these numbers is like, the, imagine that you're viewing a picture, and each of you are going to an art museum and you're examining a particular, you know, a work of art. Each of you are going to see something different. Who's right? Well, both of you are because you're coming at it from different points of view. And these particular elements and relationships, and they're not meant to be wholly concrete. They're meant to paint a picture and to help you establish the relationships of what he's trying to communicate. And what Hagoth and his 5400 are trying to communicate 
is something very important because it leads us to an understanding of the doctrine of ascension or translation, as well as the idea of becoming one with God. So again, we will go on, and, and I can make this available to you as well, but the idea of 400 distills to 40 mem, one of the three mother letters, it's the idea of a mother's womb, a symbol for ascending and descending the tree of life. When Moses went up 40 days and Christ went to the wilderness for 40 days, that is a symbol for they literally ascended the entire tree of life and came back down. They ascended in, in to heaven and came back. Um, it's also a symbol for a door, something that is movable. It's the movable part of a door, like the slab. Uh, it symbolizes the power to admit or bar entrance. It represents a birth opening, and it's also the numerical equivalent of the Father. And of course, if we distill the number 540, it equals to the word shamar, which means observe this, pay attention, behold what he's telling you, and all that in a number. So 5400 going to the land northward, giving you, and yet the number itself contains the symbol, yep, as even if you go to its basic root to the number nine, the letter Tet, which is in the land northward, in the Hebrew mindset. It also represents Yilhat, the power of God. It also represents a serpent, not, not an evil serpent, but like the serpent on Moses' staff or Caduceus, the idea of a and a serpent that rises, a serpent type of life or spirit that rises up. The, the idea of a serpent is not always evil in ancient Israel. In fact, it, the idea of, a, of the serpent and the hash, it can also symbolize a shining one or an angelic being. So what is this mystery? Well, in the Israelite prophetic tradition, the direction north corresponds to the concept of strength and power, the abode of powers and principalities and the world of the angelic. While the little, literal story does portray a group of people who built ships to set sail to the land northward, the underlying prophetic story and teaching is about a group of people who transcend and transform the natural man and woman and ascend to the upper worlds. Now, let's take a look at the name Hagoth himself. His name is of even importance. Hagoth, Hagot. Okay, it carries the relationship with the word Haggai, meaning a festive or ingathering of people. So what did he do? He gathered people uh, onto these ships to take them to the land northward. Um, he also, it's even more important and a direct meaning, there's a greater meaning connected with the name Hagoth. And its actual name literally will be, his actual name will be found in Psalm 49.3. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. The word there for meditation is not hagot, it's hagot. Haga, meaning like to growl or like meditate, but it's hagot. Here the word for meditation is the word hagot. It comes from the, the Hebrew word, the root word haga, meaning to growl, to meditate, or the growling of a lion. And that is anciently associated with, with a very ancient doctrine called the Roaring of the Lions, which you will actually find, strangely enough, in your Pearl of Great Price with Enoch and the Roaring of the Lions coming out of the, um, the, coming out of the, um, the wilderness. But the, like I said, the worship, and you can see that in the Pearl of Great Price 713. So his actual name is given to us to understand that you're about to receive a teaching from ancient Israel that contains the ancient practices of meditation, or in reality, we don't really call it meditation so much in the Hebrew language. It's the idea of bonding with God. Meditation in our, in our culture is the closest word that probably comes close because there is a meditative practice that goes with it in the sense of it is a spiritual practice. But it is also the idea is a practice that is meant to bond you to God. So the record continues. And this is where it gets interesting because here we get into some Hebrew symbolic language. So on the literal part, it says, therefore, it became expedient for Shevlon to confer those sacred things, meaning the, the plates and those engravings, upon the son Helaman, who is called Helaman, being after the name of his father. Now behold, all those engravings, remember that word, engravings. When you see that word in the Book of Mormon, it actually has a double meaning, which were in the possession of Helaman, were sent 
were written and sent forth among the children of men throughout all the land, except, except it were those parts which had been commanded by Alma should not go forth. Nevertheless, these things were to be kept sacred and handed down from one generation to another. Translation, handed down to us. Okay, and we won't have time to go into the meanings of the name Shevlon or even Helaman because there's a little bit more there in the symbolism. But the important part is the idea of engravings. When you see that phrase, another uh, it, engravings in Hebrew is also meaning, has a crazy meaning of meditations. So in other words, he's handing down these sacred practices of bonding with God. So, for example, you know, it, it's connected to meditation or engraving something on our minds and hearts, specifically the word hakak, meaning to cut or engrave, the word hak representing the insertion of the spiritual into the physical. So these practices are going to insert the spirit into this physical form. It carries with it the idea of progression from the physical to the spiritual, from becoming unclean to becoming clean or pure. So in the Israelite mind, meditation or bonding is, is the idea is connected with becoming one with God. And Alma commanded these things that they should go forth, and he put them in the possession of his son, Helaman. Now, notice what happens. Next, you have the book of Helaman. What do you make a bet? He encoded these sacred acts and practices of bonding into the record of the book of Helaman. Well, he did. And we're going to go through some of them. We won't have time tonight to go through all of them. But we'll go through at least, we'll, we'll show you closely the first one, which is really the foundation and is the foundation practice of all the ancient Israelite prophetic. But I will at least just show you where the others are um, so that you can explore on your own. But we'll start in Helaman 3. Now, Helaman 1 and, and 2, uh, again, contain astronomical teachings. The story of Peharan, Peyanki, Pekumani are the varying voices of God. And I have a presentation on my YouTube channel that you're welcome to look at that goes to that into much more depth. But on this one, let's take a look at Helaman 327 because it yields us the first practice of bonding. Thus we see that the Lord, this is verse 27, thus we see that the Lord is merciful unto all those who will, in the sincerity of their hearts, call upon his holy name. Yea, thus we see that the gate of heaven is open unto all those who will believe in the name of Christ, who is the Son of God. And then he goes on. And he talks about how, you know, this will notice the 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 almost like the sailing motif that he's using here. Yes, we see that those who will let, who whosoever will may let hold upon them, um, and I can't even see my own writing here, but the uh, hold upon the word of God which is quick and powerful, that terms quick and powerful is the idea of something that will change you, that will transform you from the inside out, which shall divide asunder the, all the cunning and the snares and the wiles of the devil and lead the man of Christ, and pay attention, the man of Christ in a straight and narrow course. That straight and narrow course goes all the way back to the very first symbol that we saw in the tree of life. It's the center pillar of the tree of life. That is called the straight and narrow. You go through the center pillar, you're going the straight and narrow. Across that everlasting gulf of misery, misery, which is prepared to engulf the wicked, and land their souls like a ship. Yes, their immortal souls at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven, to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and, J and J Jacob, and with all our holy fathers to go no more out. Now let's take a closer look. Here's what we want to see. Thus we may see that the Lord is merciful unto all those who will in the sincerity of their hearts call upon his name, his holy name. Yes, thus we may see that the gate of heaven is open unto all those, even to those who will believe in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. The Lord, yod heh vav -Heh, Yehovah, is being paralleled with the gate of heaven. Here, the name of God, you'll see there, and it's Hebrew, yod heh vav -Heh. Um, It's the idea that is the gate of heaven. What is the gate of heaven? It's the same concept that Nephi talks about of entering in by the gate or the way. It's the same concept. It's the same. It is, they are interconnected principles. So 
connected with water baptism and the baptism of fire, we see here that there is a that there is a practice, a discipline, an a, a act of bonding with God that is connected with his name, Yodhevave, and the gate of heaven. So why is Yodhevave, Yehovah, the gate of heaven? Well, first off, we need to understand what the gate of heaven is. Okay. It is the first, Yehovah, his name, is the first of all meditations. It is the foundation. It's also known as calling upon the name. This is not arms folded prayer like we think of. This is a bonding practice, which an individual or a couple or even a group of people could do. The idea is as they call upon the name, they enter, that they bond with God. It's placing your, your, your desire, your kavanah, your thoughts of your heart and your emotions, and you're combining them into one to bond with him. It's expressed not so much through language as it is through desire. Okay. And so this is the idea of bonding with God. It is the bonding with God or connecting with him that brings about the transformation. In other words, like Alma, who was passed out for three days and repented while he was passed out, the acts of the fruits meet for repentance follow the transformation experience. We can't put the cart before the horse. You cannot produce the fruits of repentance unless you have first connected with God. And the fruits are not specific to-do lists or checklists. There are things that, as we connect with God, are the natural fruits of the spirit as sap running through our tree, our branch, if you will. So why the gate of heaven? Well, what was the gate of heaven? Well, this should tell you something. The gate of heaven was the Tower of Babel. It was called the gate of heaven. So why would that be connected to the Tower of Babel? Because obviously that was obviously a negative experience. Well, the tower itself, a tower itself in Hebrew, it is uh, symbolized by the letter Lamed. And it's a flying tower with no foundation. But the tower itself, that should sound familiar if you're looking at Lehi's dream, the like a flying tower or a tower, a great and spacious building with no foundation is a flying Lamed, the letter Lamed in Hebrew. Okay, it represents their society, their, their teachings, all of it. So if the Tower of Babel of confusion represents their teachings, their society, their thing, you know, things that, that produce confusion. The name of Yehovah is also a tower. The name of the Lord, Yehovah, is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs 18, 100. Actually, that might be 1810. I think I missed the parent close parenthesis on that one. But the idea behind this is that anciently there was a practice of bonding, contemplating, <clears throat> uh, intoning, um, visualizing, the name of God. And the purpose is, as our attention, intention and our attention is directed to him, something happens in the spiritual world. That spark that we call the spirit, that spark of the divine that is within man in ancient Israel, is eternally connected. And as we you know, call upon the name, it's like a, an air that fans that flame and makes it brighter. It's like the thing which opens the conduit. It's the very foundational practice because it bonds us with God from the inside out. And if you'll notice on the right, what does it look like? If I take yod he it looks like a man. The Yod is the head. The arms are his, the He. Our torso is the Vav and our legs are the lower He. And that does play a very significant role, especially when you're looking at the brother of Jared's uh, interaction with the Lord. This is a very intricate teaching and, and integral to that particular um, epic there. So what are some of the examples of this? So let's see if we can do this today. This will work. Yud, He, Vav, He. One of the, the visualization is very much similar to the brother of Jared molten stones out of Mount Shelem, meaning uh, peace, solitude, meditation. It's the idea of bonding again. But it is his, his idea of molten stones 
gives us also an idea of clear stones. And they would actually envision in ancient Israel the letters of the name of God in these fiery stones, if you will. And they would contemplate, they would meditate upon it, they would, they would, you know, visualize it, they would even intone it. And I believe if I can do this, I I hope I don't know if the sound will come through, and you guys will have to tell me if it does. But here's an example of the intoning, and I hope you can hear it. But if not, I'll give you a website where you can. Can you hear that? I don't know. Can anybody tell me if they hear that? Yeah, I heard it. Oh, perfect. That is the intoning of the name of God. It is one example. There are others that are not necessarily having to do with the intoning, but it does have to do with the visualization. Would you play it again? Sure. It should keep going. Can you hear it? No, we only heard it once. Still not. Still not? Let's try this again. Yeah, I got nothing you, there. There's nothing there. You can't hear it. I mean, we did once. Oh, I'm not sure why. It's, it must be being temperamental. It's just a short little. It was just like one horn. It was just like one horn. Just a short little toot. Hmm. I wonder why it's not coming through. That's... I'd love to hear that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, if there's a, I'm at the, I have a file I can probably, I can even give you the gentleman that, that, that does this. Awesome. Um, he's a Jew by the name of uh, Jonathan Goldman. Um, in this particular uh, pronunciation, you'll notice that he actually intones it using the vowel pronunciation of God's name, Iawe. Those are the sacred vowels. But a lot of people get into fights over the intonation of the vocalization of the name. Some will say you're never supposed to do it, never supposed to pronounce it. I've never bought into that in my entire life. And then there were a lot of Jews that would rip my head off for that. But here's the thing. Um, the name of God was meant to be used. And by keeping this information from the masses, it kept the power in the hands of a very few people. And so this is why many of the prophetic schools of the prophets went underground. So in this case, like, for example, if you'll notice, I'll, I'll you often use the, the consonantal pronunciation, Yehovah, okay? But the priestly pronunciation was a vowel intonation, Yahweh. And people want to fight, but actually both were correct. This one was used according to the ancient records that we have more toward the idea of bonding with God used in the sacred temple, whereas the other, yod usually wasn't even pronounced at all in later times, but uh, it was the consonantal. So there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of debate on that. I try not to enter that because the idea is a person could even, you know, visualize, like when it talks about the brother of Jared moltening or visualizing in, the, in their mind, uh, the idea of moltening is, vision, is envisioning these things, of these stones, which is what in ancient Israel, even later in uh, the great teacher by the name of the Baal Shem Tov, the same practice that he used to bond with God, very similar to what you see being described with the brother Jared and the molting of the stones and then becoming illuminated. I'd like to listen to you for a month solid, and uh, but we've got a couple more minutes. Oh, okay. Wow, it went by fast. Okay, we're just about done. So let's let's. So I'm, we're gonna go quick here, guys. But here they are. Here's the second one: uh, pillar of fire meditation, pillar of fire in the desert, pillar of fire with Nephi. It's an actual meditation. So there's five of them. The language of angels. That's the that's the third one. Nephi on his tower. That is the fourth one. And of course, we get to the fifth one which is bonding with the sun, meaning the son of God. That's where you get, that's something that was added later. Um, and if you'll notice in, in 11, 13, it talks about uh, in the 80 and 60 year, 
80 and 6 is equal to the number of the name of Elohim. And uh, Samuel, his name is El. So you begin to see the intricacies of these particular. Um, you begin to see that the Book of Mormon is interwoven with many of these ancient teachings. It just takes the eyes to be able to see it. And as we explore, and as we become closer and pattern ourselves off the, to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, as we begin to learn these things, these things will open up. You know, these are the things that begin to teach us how to, to bond with God and connect. These were the actual disciplines passed down by which Hagot or Hagoth and his 5400 went to the land northward. So I know that's a lot, but that is the that is an overview or survey, if you will, of the prophetic science of the Book of Mormon. So I went as fast as I could, but I, I apologize if I took too much time. Boss, you did awesome. Yeah, we're all sitting here just in awe, in awe. I want to make a couple of comments um, that you may not be aware of. Now, my understanding is you were preoccupied. You couldn't join us last night. Is that right? Yeah, I had to work last night. Hurricane yeah. duty's coming up. So, I'm yeah, yeah. so no excuses. It's cool. I'm just telling you that what's so fascinating is that I just want you to know some of the themes that were talked about last night and we're just like mind exploded. So um, Brenda, my wife, took a talk about the word of great wisdom, but she focused on wisdom. Jody did a great job and was talking about the womb and the womb as the tree of life. And you're talking about Yod, the umbilical cord and the womb of the tree of life. And I was like, nobody gave you these notes, but you seem to be providing a Hebraic summary of much of what we discovered last, what we discussed last night. It was absolutely awesome. Oh, wow. I'm yeah. sorry I missed it. That yeah. and, well, I mean, it's awesome that you picked up on that. And, um, and uh, yeah, just absolutely blown. So do you, uh, one question we all want to ask, do you have any more that you could, you could share with us about the tree of life, its feminine form, the womb space, the creative, that anything else you want to share with us on that? Uh, are you talking like the divine feminine? Well, no, you'd already made a reference to the tree of life. It's feminine. It, back to that. What you'd already talked about, if you want to expand any more on that. Oh, well, what I can say is that the tree of life itself is both masculine and feminine. Uh, it has a feminine pillar and a masculine pillar. The idea is that when the two pillars merge, okay, or become one, a state of beauty is, is reached. In other words, the oneness of the male and the female represents a, a is the is the like the that state of tifera or beauty that we are to reach which is a perfect balance between the male and the female aspects of wisdom female understanding but understand that they're not really describing so much masculine and feminine sense of gender it's a lot of times it's function so like for example what people don't often understand is wisdom if it is received if you are receiving wisdom it is a feminine aspect if you are giving wisdom, it is considered a masculine aspect. Same thing with understanding, the same thing with mercy. Receiving is more of a feminine function. Masculine is the bestowal function. And it, it, it goes back to a very ancient principle that governs the tree of life is if it's the idea of receiving to bestow. If I receive from God to covet, then the blessings stop. But if I receive from God, to bless and bestow upon others, then the blessings and the spirit increases, you know, exponentially. So that's what I can probably share with you regarding that, the, the tree of life is it has masculine and feminine aspects. And the purpose of it is to reach a state of oneness. Everything is about masculine and feminine in balance. It is not the masculine over the feminine. Notice that they're standing side by side. You know, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the, you know, well, there it goes. Now it's nice to cooperate. But, uh, but it's the idea of the masculine and feminine side by side and merging into a state of oneness, which is that center pillar. When, when we see that imagery, when we see those aspects. The idea is everything in there is meant to describe us as individuals as married, married, you know, married couples, mm. um, all of these things. Mm. 
and the awesome. purpose is to ascend. Awesome. I can't, you know, just have overwhelming positive comments on the chat. Uh, one person says, can you recommend a good resource to learn more about the astrotheological symbolism? Oh, my gosh. Um, His blog. <laughs> yeah, probably my blog. <laughs> but there are books on astrotheology. The only problem that you have to be careful of in modern, modern scholars are using astrotheology and, and they're trying to say, oh, see, this is all made up. It's just they're looking at the stars. You know, and, and this is not a real thing. What they failed to understand is Hebraically, it, it is a real thing. And it's also at the same time meant to communicate these things. So, uh, gosh, is there any one? Uh, I would have to do some research on any. I don't know of any one singular uh, book, honestly. I've, I've looked through so many over the years. 